feel like a little extra excitement in the air. As we gather this morning to worship, uh, we're going to continue our, our series we call Christmas Carols. Today we're going to look at Away in the Manger. And I just want to bring your attention to a few announcements. Um, in the back, on the, on the back table right there, they're going to begin a, we're going to have another um, Bible study. Uh, it's going to be during the week. Um, well, maybe we can. Uh, at, uh, I got mail. Between 10 and 11, right? Yeah, between 10 and 11, there's, there's a sheet back there. It's going to be the armor of God by um, per, uh, Priscilla uh, Shire. Uh, they're going to be doing that study, and there's some forms in the back to fill out. And I think you're going to select the days, right? You haven't picked the day yet? So you'll, you'll fill out and put that in Kathy's box. Also, the Wednesday night class, on Wednesday nights, the mixed class of men and women, that class is going to kick back in on January the 5th, okay? So if you're a part of that class, just a reminder, that class is going to start back on January the 5th. Um, that's coming up. Also, ladies, don't forget this Tuesday night. I think it's here at the building. Yes, yeah, it's got something on that. Maybe. Go ahead. Um, yeah. Make sure you bring your bedding that we're collecting. Um, our $5 snack gift, and it is a salad month, so bring those healthy salads. So, yeah. <laughs> healthy salad? Yeah. Okay. Second throw that in there. Talk okay, throw it in there. All right, great. Um, also, the church office will be closed both Thursday and Friday for the holiday as well, so make note of that. Um, any other announcements? How about any anniversaries this week? Birthdays? Put your hands down. Ethan's birthday. Ethan's birthday coming up. Ruby has anniversary and birthday this week. This week? Yeah. Are you? Are you? I? <laughs> so, how long have you been, been married? 36 years. 36. Yeah. And you have a no, birthday? Yes. And no what? Uh, no, 36. Not, 36. Yeah. 36. <laughs> okay. 63. Thanks, Mr. Russell. All right. Okay, any others? Put your hands down. I know we have birthdays on. They don't. So do. They don't. All right. Okay, let's sing happy birthday to Ruby. Psalm chapter 95, verse 1. Let's read it together. It says, Come, let us sing for joy to the Lord. Let us shout aloud to the rock of our salvation. Sing this morning for joy to the Lord. Let's move to worship. Today, that everything we say, everything we do, we bring honor and glory to your most glorious 
and wonderful name. We pray all these things. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Please have a seat. As we continue our worship this morning, let's sing together, O Little Town of Bethlehem. <laughs>
surgery on both of her shoulders Tuesday and her stepdad went to check on his brother and found him dead in his mother's house so his name is Matt Wilson and just remember his family Matt Wilson any others yes back in the back situation and that's a praise and then continue to remember uh, those, those still serving there in Haiti. Okay. Any others? Yes. Uh, Christy Russo that's missing. They found some of her clothes in a dumpster. That's been up to go Okay. Christy Russo. Remember, remember that. Okay. Any others? Yes. Travelers. Right. Travelers. Yes. We got a lot of them. Travelers for this week. Yes, Kathy. Uh, there's a praise. Barbara is here. Yes, Barbara. Yes. Moving on her own, I think. How you feeling? Mm-hmm. Pretty good. Pretty good. <coughs> I step in a praise. And we remember Barbara. And she recovers. Any others? Okay. Any online? No? Okay. okay, let's pray together. Uh, most Christ Heavenly Father, uh, we just come before you and and we just know that you are a great God and, and you love us so much that as we um, focus in on this Christmas season, remember that you, um, you love us so much you send your one and only son. And we think about him in that manger and um, it brings fond memories and um, all these um, almost a nostalgic feeling about um, <coughs> Christmas. We probably need to remember and not forget that you sent your son to die for our sins. And um, we're so thankful for that especially during this Christmas season as we remember that fact. Father, we're so thankful that we can gather in this place and we can um, talk about things that are on our lives and our hearts. 
And Father, um, we're so thankful um, that for the way you answer our prayers. Thank you for, um, as you, um, the, in the hostage situation in Haiti, and as you continue to um, be with those missionaries on the ground there and working. Lord, we're so thankful for the good news we re received on the ones that we've been praying for. And uh, Father, continue to, to place your hands upon them. Father, we ask you for all the men that were mentioned here today. Um, um, deaths and, Ill and illnesses and um, tests coming up. And Father, we, um, we're going to remember those. But Father, we ask you today to place your hand upon each and every one of those. Father, we ask you to be with our, our missions and um, um, eyes. And especially as eyes is on the ground there where these tornadoes have hit and, hit and they continue to work. They can be working. Um, Lake Charles helping them recover them from those those hurricanes. And Father, we just ask you to continue to bless them. That you would um, give her the wisdom and knowledge to know what to do and where to go. And that, Father, she would use her, the funds she's received in a wise way. Um, that you would, they would win people to you. Father, we're so thankful this day to be in a place like this. And that we can come together and we can mention these things that are on our hearts and on our minds. And Father, would you ask you to place your hand on each and every one of those. Even the ones... There are our that were mentioned out loud today. That Father, we ask you to intercede on each of every hand. Father, as we continue to worship you, we just pray that you would bless the remainder of the service. We pray all these things in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. For our communion hymn today, uh, we're going to sing Glory to His Name. Uh, if you haven't already, uh, communion <coughs> emblems are in the back of the auditorium. If you haven't gotten yours yet, you can do that while we sing this song. Um, after we sing this, we'll have a short devotion, and then we will um, take communion together. So let's sing glory to his name. In despair, I bowed my head 
There is no peace on earth, I said. For hate is strong and, mo and mocks the song of peace on earth, goodwill to men. But Longfellow refused to stop listening. It was as if he heard a voice, a chime, a chant sublime, reminding him of the truth of God until from the silence he broke. Then peal the bells more loud and deep. God is not dead, nor doth he sleep. The wrong shall fall, the right prevail, with peace on earth, goodwill to men. Have the bells been silent for you this Christmas season? Maybe for the first time in your life a loved one is not around to celebrate with you. Maybe the pandemic is taking its toll on you physically or mentally or both. Perhaps you're burdened with the relentless spiritual attacks of the evil one. Whatever has caused the bells to be silent in your life, don't stop listening. Be attentive. The truth of God resounds by gathering around this table. God knows his creation has been ravaged by, the, by Satan and infected by sin. He knows you are his victims. <clears throat> and, and through Jesus Christ, he has done something about it. He didn't come with a sudden display of might, but with a silent display of vulnerability as a baby and a manger. He did not remain a faraway creator, but became Emmanuel, God with us. He lived among us, identified with us, even wept while here. He died for us so we wouldn't have to. He overcame death and sin. In a word, God gave us hope, hope through Jesus Christ. In 1 Peter 1, 6 through 9, it reads, In all this you <coughs> greatly rejoice, though now for a little while you may have to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. These have come to you come, <coughs> come so that the proven genuineness of your faith may result in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. <clears throat> though you have not seen him, you love him. And even though you do not see him now, you believe in him and are filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy, for you are receiving the end result of your faith, the salvation of your souls. So today, <clears throat> as we gather around this table, listening we will hear the unbroken song of the peace on earth, goodwill to men. Let us pray. Father, we do thank you so much for this privilege to come before your table today to partake of these emblems, this cup and this loaf. It represents the body of Christ and the blood that was spilled for, for us to cover our sins. Father, we do thank you so much for this, this gift and, and all that you have shown us. Father, we thank you so much for Jesus. Thank you so much for your love. Praise in Jesus' name. Amen. We're gathered today to take these young looks together, so let's take the bread with this time, which represents Jesus' body. Let's take it. We also gather before us today to worship by the praying of our tithes and offerings. Again, this morning the offering place are in the back of the auditorium. Uh, so you can drop your offering in there if you haven't already. Um, also, those who are, who are online uh, can give through our, our um, app, also through our website. You can also go mail it through your, your own bank or mail it here directly, or you can uh, bring it back sometime this week. So, but as part of our, uh, um, our worship today, let's, let's pray for our tithes and offerings. Most gracious Heavenly Father, it's a great privilege to be able to gather in a place such as this to worship you. And Father, now we worship you through the giving of our tithes and offerings. We just pray today that you would uh, bless those who are able to give, those who are not able to give. But 
Father, you would take those offerings and those gifts and you would, uh, you would uh, just multiply them, uh, that you would use them for the building of your kingdom. Father, we ask for wisdom and knowledge and know exactly how to use that to, so, to effectively build your kingdom here on this earth. So we just pray now for those who are, who are giving this day and you would take those offerings and we pray all these things. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. This time the kids are dismissed to go to Children's Church. It's hard to believe that it is the week of Christmas. Um, end of this week we'll be celebrating Christmas with our families. Um, I'm so excited that we're here this morning and we are get to spend this time together, especially uh, the Christmas here we're going to look at here today. We've been looking at, if you want to go ahead and take your notes inside your bulletin this morning, there's um, some notes. Um, they look like this. You can pull those out and follow along and get a pen so you can write as we go along. But we, today we're going to look at one of the most sentimental uh, Christmas carols. Like I said earlier, it's one that probably learned first, you know, because it's such an easy carol to sing. Uh, well, a lot of times we can sing it off the palo very easily, and that is away in the manger. Um, if you haven't, uh, uh, now, what we've been doing uh, through this month is we've been looking at the different carols and seeing what we can learn from those carols. And so, away in the manger, um, we don't know the story really that's behind the writing of away in the manger. It first appeared in print in the Lutheran Sunday School curriculum back in 1885, but they don't know originally who originally wrote those lyrics. For a long time, we thought Martin Luther did, uh, the, the reformer, but later that was discredited as he wasn't really the author. Now, you know, it's, it's easy to dismiss this particular <coughs> carol, especially as a children's song. Uh, we can say this is this is a kid song that we sung so many times before. But I think it would be a huge mistake to do that. Because it talks about the birth of Jesus, where he was born, the environment and the circumstances around it. And it has great significance. And I believe it has great power. You see, we often imagine that Jesus was born in this nice, warm, scenic barn or some stable where everything looked perfect. There were... That wasn't the case at all. I mean, instead, he was being born in a being born in a barn. Most scholars think he was born probably in a, just an enclave, a, a small cave, where basically all it would do is just basically get you out of the wind and maybe just barely out of the elements. It's just maybe an, a, a, an outcropping that people would put their animals in, and it probably wasn't super clean, and it wasn't beautiful to look at. Uh, was not comfortable, and it was not a warm place. Uh, by the way, Jesus didn't have a crib either. You know, he was born in a manger, and it would sound fine until you realize that this is where the animals ate out of, right? Uh, a manger in the first century uh, Judah, Judea uh, probably was made out of stone, and I've seen some that were just nothing more than a stone that you would just lay something on top of, put the hay on top of. A lot of them looked like this. Wow. And just a stone with a little cut out where the hay would go into it. Uh, nothing spectacular, right? Jesus wouldn't have had a nice, comfortable blankets or cushions. He would have, would have just hay that would have been around him. It would not have been the super comfortable environment. Now I want you to think about this for a moment. Here we have Jesus, the Son of God, being born in a primitive shelter which was meant for animals being placed in a feeding trough that animals would eat out of. It was exactly, um, would, it would not be what we call first class accommodations. In fact, I can't think of a more humbling environment for a baby, any baby to be born in. Even in those humbling conditions, we're reminded in our carol of who Jesus really is. If you're looking at notes, in the lyrics of Away in a Manger, there's that first short phrase that's repeated again and again. It's in the second line. It's the first four words. I want you to underline them. The little Lord Jesus. Would you underline those four words? The little Lord Jesus. When you think about this song, we tend to focus in on the cute little baby part. 
Jesus is a six pound, eight ounce little baby, cute, safe, warm, nice, fuzzy feelings, right? The sweet, sweet baby. When we do that, we miss out on something much bigger, something much more significant. We miss out on the most powerful aspect of this song, that Jesus is Lord. He's Lord today, he was Lord yesterday, and he will always be Lord. He is Lord. Recognize Jesus as Lord is one of the most significant decisions that we make at Christmas. Today, we're not going to focus on the little baby Jesus or how he laid down his sweet head. and said, we're going to focus on this fact. Jesus is Lord. Now, I know that the word Lord, you know, today, uh, it's not used much in our culture today. And sometimes the word Lord, it, it has some negative connotations. But it's important that we look at it, what it means, because the New Testament, can you even imagine how many times the word Lord is just used in the New Testament portion of the Bible? It's used over 740 times. It appears 740 times there. And that is very, very significant. In fact, right after Jesus was born, the angels made the announcement to some nearby shepherds. This is in Luke chapter 2, beginning verse 10 in the New Testament. And this is what it says. Look what it says. Don't be afraid, he said. I bring you good news that will bring great joy to all people. The Savior, yes, the Messiah, the Lord, has been born today in Bethlehem, the city of David. Now, on that second line from the bottom, I want you to underline those two words. It appears again. The Lord. From the very beginning of this life, it is established that Jesus Christ is Lord. This isn't just some baby. This is, is not, it's just not any baby. But this is the Savior of the world that's being born. He is Lord. And the question for you and I today is this. If Jesus is Lord, what does that mean for us? If Jesus is Lord, what does it mean for my everyday life? If Jesus is Lord, what does that mean for for my career. What, if Jesus is Lord, what does that mean in my marriage? What does it mean in my dating relationships? What does it mean for my studies? If Jesus is Lord, what does that mean for my life? Now, the New Testament of the Bible was written in Greek. In Greek, the word was translated Lord is this word, kurios. I'll put it there in your notes for you. Kurios. And kurios is a Greek word for Lord. And here's what it meant. I want you to write this down. Kyrios meant supreme in authority, controller, Lord. Write that down. Supreme in authority, controller, Lord. Write that down and stay there for just a moment. For many of us, let's be honest, the word controller, that's a problem, isn't it? When we think about somebody being controller over us, see, that's a problem for us because we like to be in control. If Jesus wants to be in control of our lives, we want to be in control of our lives. If there's going to be a problem, that's where the problem is at, right? Jesus is going to have some competition because he wants to be the control of our lives. Now, I don't know about you, but personally, I don't have that problem. I, I know other people do, but I'm, I, I'm not a control freak as long as everyone else does exactly what I want to do, right? <laughs> No, that's okay. I don't have a problem there. Now, but that's not how it goes, is it? The control. We like to have control. Chances are, a lot of us are that way. We want the ones to be in control. You want to be in control of every little detail of your life. And some of you, you like every little second of your life to be planned out. And you say, I want my kids to do exactly what I say. I want my wife to do exactly what I say. I, I, this Christmas, I want everyone to go, per, everything to go perfectly, just the way I planned it out. It has to be perfect. It has, this is the way I want it. I want control. Unfortunately, and you've experienced this too, I'm sure you have, just life isn't like that, is it? Most of life is out of control. Listen, if Jesus is Lord, if he is supreme in authority, if he is the controller, then you cannot be in control. See, Jesus is the Lord of your life if you're always fighting for control of your life. Why should I make Jesus Lord of my life? Why is it so important that I follow Jesus 
to be the ultimate leader in my life? Well, for starters, it's a matter of love, Jesus says. The number one way that we can show that, that you can show me that you love me is through obedience of me. Jesus says, if you love him, we will obey him. If we love him, he will be Lord and leader of our life. His lordship is all about love. See, here's the cool thing. It's only when I surrender my entire life to God. That, that is when God is going to bless every area of my life to the fullest. Don't miss that. The, the more I surrender to God, the more I give God the control, the deeper my connection is with Him. See, that's why you and I, the only way we're ever going to experience God's um, best for our life in every area of our lives is when we surrender the control of those areas to God. We give God control of those areas. And that's what I want us to talk about today. How do I... How, how do I know if my life is fully surrendered to Christ? How do I surrender my life to Jesus? How do I allow Jesus to really be Lord of my life? See, this isn't going to be some warm, fuzzy Christmas message where Jesus lays down his sweet head. This is going to be a message, a challenging message about giving God control of your life. Open up your notes on the inside. Today I want to give you three questions we can ask ourselves and determine if we are fully surrendered to Jesus Christ. Three questions to determine if I'm fully surrendered to Jesus and if He is truly my Lord. Here's the first question. Have I accepted God's gift of salvation? Have I, have I accepted God's gift of salvation? Now, I want to take just a moment and I want you to think about this question. If you were last week, we, we talked about that a little bit last week, but have you accepted the gift of salvation? Have you asked Jesus to be your Savior? See, the Bible says we all need the gift of salvation so that we can be saved from the consequences of our sin. Now, sin, you know, we are talking about Jesus being Lord. Sin is where instead of letting Jesus be Lord, we instead make ourselves Lord of our own lives. Instead of letting God be God, we decide we ourselves are going to play God. God says, I created you. I have a plan for your life. And I want you to live your life this way. But we say, no, I don't want to live my life that way. I'm going to be leader of my life. I'm going to do it my way. You're not going to be Lord Jesus. I'm Lord of my life. I'm in control. I'm going to do it my way. See, that's sin. We turn our back on God. We rebel against God. The Bible says that sin creates a separation between us and God. And that is the consequences of our sin. We're separated from God's presence, from His peace, from His power in our life. Even more significantly, we're separated from God for all of eternity. We miss out on heaven. See, the good news is that Jesus came into this world that first Christmas. And Jesus is God's gift to us the very first Christmas gift to help us overcome the consequences of sin. So, so that we can have a relationship with God, so that we can have eternal life in heaven. Jesus died on the cross so that our sins could be forgiven. Those consequences can be removed from our life. And the question becomes, have, how do I accept the free gift of God's salvation? Remember we talked about this a little bit last week? The Apostle Paul um, in, in your notes, right, in Romans chapter 10, in, in verse 9, he says, If you openly, what? Declare Jesus is what? Lord. Lord. <clears throat> if we openly declare Jesus is the Lord, you believe in your heart that Jesus raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. For it is by believing in your heart that you are made right with God, and it is by openly declaring your faith that you are saved. Now, two things I want you to notice here. First, in order to allow Jesus to be our Savior, you have to believe in your heart that He is your Savior. You have to believe that Jesus is who He says He is. God did not that that, that that God did raise Him from the dead. You have to believe that. That's the first part. You also there's a second part. You have to openly declare that Jesus is Lord. Now don't miss this. Jesus can't be your Savior if you don't acknowledge Him 
as Lord of your life. It can't happen. You see, this idea that you can embrace Jesus as Savior right, by rejecting him as Lord or leader of your life is a dangerous delusion. It's dangerous. The idea that I'm going to come over here and sort, sort of do a bait and switch with God. God, I want your salvation, but I'm not going to let that affect the way that I live my life at all. See, that's a dangerous delusion. See, in other words, we can't accept Jesus' free gift of salvation and, and think. You know, we can't accept Jesus' free gift of salvation and think that it's not going to affect the rest of my life, any of the other parts of my life, because you do have to make him Lord of your life. See, you can't just play games with God and say, I'm going to take my salvation, I'm going to secure my eternity, I'm going to live my life my own way. If so, you're completely missed the whole point of salvation. And salvation leads to a changed life. Salvation doesn't come without recognizing that Jesus is Lord. You see, the gift of salvation that you receive from God, it may, it may not have cost you anything, but it cost God everything. It cost him his only son. He loved you so much that he made a great sacrifice for you. And only our, only our the only one reason, reasonable response to that is that we give our life back to God. We surrender it by allowing him to be our Lord, our leader. So listen, this is an important question that I believe that some of us here today need to wrestle with. That is, is G if Jesus isn't changing your life, if he's not impacting your decisions, if he's not setting the direction of your life, you have to ask yourself, do I really know him? Do I really believe in him? See, I'm not saying you have to be perfect at all. But if your salvation doesn't impact the way that you're living your life, and how you make your decisions, you have to ask yourself, because if you do, if you, if you do receive that gift of salvation, it changes your life. He becomes your Lord. The Apostle Paul writes about these free gifts of salvation in Ephesians chapter 2, beginning in verse 8. He says, God saved you by grace when you believe that you can't take credit for this. It is a gift from God. Salvation is not a reward for the good things we have done so none of us can boast about it. Now hold your finger there for just a moment. Stay right there. Let me ask you, have you accepted the free gift and allowed God to be your Savior and Lord? If so, has it changed the way that you're living your life? Has it changed you? If so, there, there, if there is no changes there, if Jesus, Jesus has not become the leader of your life, then there's something missing. Because knowing Jesus always, always changes you. Followers of Jesus, well, they follow Jesus by definition, right? And if I am a follower of Jesus, then I follow him. He's the leader of my life. If you've never taken that step and accepted the gift of salvation, I want you to do that today. I remember the day that I accepted Jesus as the Lord of my life. See, I, was, I accepted Jesus in this very room. I remember I was 15 years old. I remember walking down the aisle during a revival. I could hardly wait. I believed who Jesus said he was, and I confessed him as my Lord. I repented of my sins and went down in the watery grave of baptism, was immersed for the forgiveness of my sins, and received the gift of the Holy Spirit at that very moment. And I had been living for him some 42 years. Now, I have, it hasn't been, I don't have some fantastic story of how I turn from addiction or I turn from a life of crime. I didn't, it didn't work like that for me. But I remember that moment of salvation and it had a profound effect on my life, the direction of my life. When I received the gift of salvation, first of all, God gave me eternal life and I had a home in heaven. Because of that, I don't have to be afraid of death. I don't have to wonder where I'm going to spend eternity. I have confidence because I received the free gift of salvation. But also, on that night, Jesus became the leader of my life. And it's hard to explain looking back. But I can look back over my life through school and through high school and through college and through getting married and moving from church to church and youth ministry and then preaching ministries. And I can see how God has led me in different places. 
how in different points of my life he led me to the right people and how in different points of my life he's also protected me from the wrong people. He kept me on track. He kept me out of the wrong dating relationships that could have taken me off course and put me in the right ones. I can now see how God has led me. He led me from making dumb decisions that might have put my life on a different path altogether. What I discovered is this. When I received God's salvation, having Jesus as the leader of my life is the very best part of that. See, now heaven's not bad, but I'm just saying. But having Jesus as leader of my life is the very best part. In order to determine if I am fully surrendered to Jesus, if He is Lord of my life, I have to ask, have I accepted God's gift of salvation? Then across the page, in your notes, here's the second question we need to ask. Have I submitted every area of my life to Jesus? After you accept God's gift of salvation, you choose to follow Him, then you have to make sure you're submitting to Him in every area of your life. Listen, if we're honest with ourselves, there are a whole lot of us who fall short. Because we say, hey, I surrender to God, but are there certain areas of our life that we have been holding back, that we've been holding control over? We keep pulling back from God. We don't submit to God. In Luke chapter 6, verse 46, Jesus has this, some very strong words, and he says, look what it says. He says, so why do you keep calling me Lord, Lord, when you don't do what I say? That's that's pretty heavy, isn't it? See, Jesus says, look, don't be a fake. Don't pretend to call me Lord when I am really not your Lord. When you're not listening to me, when you're not following me, when you're not doing what I ask. Don't pretend that I'm your Lord of your life when you go and live any way you want to. Any way that you want to. And I've heard people say, this one sin, I know God doesn't like it, but that's just who I am. Jesus is not Lord of your life. You have to give it up. You have to give it up. Ultimately, there, this is where a lot of us get stuck in our life. We say that we want Jesus to be Lord, but we still want control. These areas of, there are areas of our lives that we just will not surrender to Him. You see, that is what it's like when we say we want Jesus as Lord of our life, but we, we don't do what he says. We don't surrender our life to him. It's sort, of, it's sort of like this. You say, all right, Jesus, I want you to be Lord of every area of my life. Jesus, I want, you, I want to follow you, but by the way, Jesus, I don't want you to say a lot about my finances. Uh, I know that you, what, what you say about money, but... I just don't want to give that area to you. I want you to be Lord of my life, but I don't want to give this part back to you. And I, I'm going to do whatever I want in this area. Jesus, I know I, I want you to be Lord of my life, but I want you to control all these areas. But Jesus, when it comes to sex, uh, I know what the Bible says about sex. It's, it's not how everyone else lives their life. So I'm going to hold that part back. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm going to do what I want to do. In this area, uh, you can have you can have everything else, but you know, when it comes to money and sex, that, 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 that's my area. Oh, but when it comes to my career, God, I want you to be Lord, but uh, you know, when it, you know, nobody's Christians before I work, and God, and it's hard to live like I'm supposed to there. And um, every every else lives differently, and it just it just doesn't fit there. So I'm gonna hold that part out. I'm gonna. I'm going, to, I'm going to take back control of that area. But every other area, God, you can have those areas. You can have everything else. You see, that's not what God wants. And then it comes to our family. God, I forgot about my family. Yeah. Oh, uh, how about I have an addiction I'm dealing with. Every other area, God, but, but not that. You be one of everything else, but not that one. You know, if we look at what we do, we say that Jesus is Lord with our words, but our lives say something completely different. What many of us 
who claim to be Christians do every day is that we rip God's truth, <laughs> literally rip it right out of the Word of God. Because we are not going to do those things by the way we live our lives. We rip it out. Many of us who claim to be Christians, we literally rip God's truth by the way we live our lives. And that's why Jesus says, why do you call me Lord if you're not going to listen to what I say? That's not surrender. See, I want to be perfectly clear today that Jesus is not a part-time Lord. And He's not looking for part-time followers. He is saying, if you want to follow me, take up your cross and follow me. If you want to find your life, then you need to lose that life first. If you want to gain real life, you've got to give your life away. You have to surrender it. You make me Lord and you follow me. The truth is the reason that many of us don't fully surrender so many areas of our life to Jesus. Let's be honest. We don't fully trust Him. We don't fully trust Jesus. See, I don't trust if I don't trust if, if I gave that area to God, if I really gave it to Him, that everything is really, really going to be okay. God. I just have to take some of that control back. And I do what I want. Let me do what I want in this area. Now listen, I get it. I really do. Here's what happens. Whenever we stay in control of an area of my life, we make the wrong decisions because Jesus is not leading us. When we make the wrong decisions, it sends our lives into a downward spiral. See, that area goes downward and, downward and it affects other areas of our lives as well because we just don't trust God. And I want you to take a moment right now and I want you to examine your life. What are the areas of your life today that you really need to surrender to Jesus? If you look in your notes, I give you a list of areas to look at. This is not an exhaustive list at all. It's just some areas, and I want you to look through it. It says, today, Lord Jesus, I surrender to you. And go through these. If any of these areas are areas that you need to surrender to Jesus, would you just circle that? Maybe you, you made a decision today. If your area is not listed there, then there's a blank. Fill it in. Maybe say, there's this relationship. I need to surrender to God because I need, to control, I need control of it. We're living, uh, we're not living according to God's word. Or maybe it's a relationship I shouldn't be in at all. Maybe it's my career. I, I haven't been, uh, haven't given God that part of my life. Maybe I haven't given God control over my family or my finances. Maybe it's my free time. How I spend my free time. Whatever it is. What area of your life right now needs to be surrendered to God? Now, let, let me give you a hint. It's probably an area that has stress. <coughs> And it has worry, it has fear, and it has hurt. If you want to know what area you're holding back from God, it's probably the area that you're most worried about because you pulled the control from God. Listen, after you identify that area, uh, uh, make a commitment to make that change. Now, maybe you're unsure. Maybe you're scared to surrender. Maybe you're worried that if you give God control in that area, you're going to be giving up something that's really good. Maybe you're worried that, that you're going to lose something that is valuable. See, that's why our memory verse is so important today. It's found in Proverbs chapter 3, verses 5 and 6. I want us to read it out loud together, beginning with trust. Are you ready? Let's read it. It says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Do not depend on your own understanding. Seek His will in all you do. And he will show you which path to take. Before you finish, I just let me challenge you. Trust the Lord with all your heart because he's fully able to be trusted. Don't depend on your own understanding. He's God. He knows what's best. Seek this. Seek his will because his path is always the best path. And so, as we're talking about God in these different areas of our life and giving control in him, Make that decision today. Three questions to determine if you're truly surrendered to Jesus Christ as your Lord. Number one, 
Have you accepted God's gift of salvation? Number two, have I submitted every area of my life? And then finally, on the back of your notes, have I sacrificed my will for God's will daily? Have I sacrificed my will for God's will daily? You see, we sacrifice our will to God when we make the decision that we are going to follow, be a follower of Jesus. We're going to follow Him. And here's the thing we need to understand. Surrendering your will to God isn't a one-time decision, and then you're done. It has to be done daily, and here's why. You and I, we're not perfect. We're not perfect people, right? You and I, we're all a little bit broken, and we're constantly fighting with God for control over our lives. Every day, we're tempted to give someone or something else first place in our life. Because of that, every day, we have to make an intentional decision to make Jesus Lord. Sometimes it's every day. Sometimes it might be every minute. Now, before we go further, I need to get technical for just, just a moment because technically, I've been saying something theologically that is not true throughout this message, and I need to get that corrected. And here it is. Technically, we don't make Jesus Lord. We don't make Him Lord. That's sort of an arrogant thing to say. Make Jesus Lord of your life. We don't make Jesus Lord. He is already Lord. He is already Lord. Whether we believe it or not, Jesus is Lord. Whether we like it or not, Jesus is Lord. And you don't make Jesus Lord. I don't make Jesus Lord. What we do is we simply surrender to what already is. Your daily surrender, your life to Him. Your surrender, you, your life to Him. You surrender to Jesus, who is Lord. You give control of your life to the one who is already in control, to the one who's already written the story. In Luke, Jesus described what it means to submit your will to God. Look, Luke chapter 9, verse 23. Jesus says, If any of you wants to be my follower, you must give up your own way, take up your cross daily, and follow me. Now, first of all, I want you to circle cross on that second line. Jesus says to follow him, you have to pick up your cross. And that's, rem that's a reminder that the same baby who is born in that manger, the same baby who we, we sing about in a way, in a manger, he would one day grow up and give his life for us on a cross so that we can have eternal life. It's a reminder that, of that, but it's also a reminder that following Jesus is seldom, seldom the easiest path. Sometimes following Jesus requires us to sacrifice. You circle cross. Now I want you to underline the word next to it. Underline the word daily. You see, acknowledging that Jesus is Lord, I said this earlier, it's not a one-time and done decision. Jesus says, listen, every day you have to pick up your cross. Every day you have to consciously give up your way. Every day you have to decide that you're going to follow me. Every day you have to sacrifice your will and what you want for my will. See, now the truth is we aren't perfect. We aren't. And I said it earlier. We're all broken. We are all sinful. It is impossible for us to, to make one decision and then that decision will direct the rest of our life. We make a decision and we just automatically follow it. We can't, we can't just say, okay, Jesus, I'm making you Lord and then... I don't have to worry about that decision ever again. No, it's a decision that we have to physically make every single day. We have to redirect our lives daily. Some of you, you're fighting this battle right now because, in truth, it's very hard to sacrifice your will for God's will. It's hard. It's natural to forget about God. It's natural to every day when we get afraid to try to grab control of that area of life and go your own way. You know, I look at it this way. I hurt myself every time I don't remember. I make my life more painful. I make my life more stressful. I make my life more difficult whenever I insist to take my will over God's will. You see, surrender is simply trusting God's plans more than the plans that we are making. It's letting Jesus take the lead instead of trying to control everything in your own life. 
Here's the truth. Everyone, you and me, every one of us eventually surrenders to something or someone. All of us are going to surrender to something or someone. If it's not God, you know what it's going to be. See, it's more than likely going to be the thing that you circle on the inside of your nose. If you don't surrender to God, then more than likely you are going to surrender to and be controlled by that area of your life that you are right now trying to control yourself. You see, you're going to be controlled by the very thing that you try to control. And some of you will surrender to a relationship. Some of you are going to surrender to your career. Some of you will surrender to money. And some of you will, res will surrender to addictions that you just cannot get rid of. We all will eventually surrender to something or someone. The difference when you surrender to God is that you're surrendering to the creator of the universe. You're surrendering to the one who created you. He who loves you. Who designed you with a specific purpose for your life. A plan in mind. And he knows what's best for you. Listen. It's a daily decision. Every morning you say, okay, God, I trust you. You are the leader. I'm going to follow you. I want your will to be done in my life today. In fact, Jesus taught us that we should pray that exact prayer every day in the Sermon on the Mount. In the most famous sermon ever taught, you read it in Matthew chapter 6. Look at what Jesus says. In fact, let's read that out loud together, beginning with May. Are you ready? Let's go. May your kingdom come soon. May your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Here's the question. I want to leave this question with you today. I want you to be honest. Can you pray this prayer and really mean it? Can you pray this prayer sincerely? Jesus says, may your kingdom come. May your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. This is what it is. God, I surrender. God, I give up control. God, I want your will to be done in my life. Even if it's not what I originally want. Even if it's not what I plan. Jesus, you are the leader of my life. You be Lord. Jesus, you take first place. I'll be honest. This is really a hard prayer to pray. If you pray this prayer and you mean it, what you're going to do is you're putting Jesus into first place in your life. It's going to radically alter the way that you live your life each and every day. Let me ask, can you pray this prayer today? Can you pray it? You know, as we head into this craziness of this final week before Christmas, as we're tempted to try to control everything and everyone in your life, I want you to remember the sweet, warm, fuzzy, safe little Christmas girl away in the manger. This time, instead of focusing on the cute little baby, Jesus, be reminded of the greater message of this song, that Jesus is and always has been and he always will be Lord. Will you bow your heads with me? Will you pray with me right now? Let's pray together. Will you bow your heads and close your eyes? This is a time right now just between you and God. Because there's some business that we need to do right now with God. Maybe there's something that you need to get rid of right now. Um, you need to get right right now. First of all, I want you to pray. Pray for those who have walked in here today and don't know if they have a relationship with God. Say, Mike, I haven't been following Jesus. I, I don't have a relationship with Him. You can have a relationship with Him today. After we finish praying here today, we offer the opportunity for you to respond. Please respond today. Come to the front of this room. And we'll pray with you today and help you to make that decision. Don't put it off another day. Do it today. Make Jesus Lord and save your life. God will forgive you. He will secure your eternity in heaven. He will give you a path of meaning and purpose to walk on. Now I also want to pray for those of you who are here today. And maybe you've been a Christian for a long time. Maybe you're a follower of Jesus, but you've been follow your following is only in words because there are areas in your life right now that he has no say in. You've taken back control and you're, you're living your life the way you want to live it. You're, you're not listening to Him. Because of that, you're experiencing pain and frustration and disappointment. 
fear. You, you don't know what to do. And that's why you're so worried and why you're so anxious. It's because you, you weren't created to be God. You weren't created to be Lord. He is the only Lord. He is the only God. And you need to surrender control so that you can really live your life. Right now as we pray, would you take that area that you are that is causing you stress and worry and fear, the one that you're trying to control, and will you turn it over to Him? Will you listen to Him? Will you follow Him? You will say, Jesus, you be Lord of my life in every area. Take this area that I've been trying to, to, um, to fight you for control over, and I surrender to you. Father, we thank you that not only are you our Savior, but you are our leader and our Lord. May we submit to you in every area and experience your very best for our lives. We pray all these things. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We're going to sing a song of decision. And maybe there's something that's one of the needs that Jesus is your Lord and Savior. Come as we sing that song. If there's other decisions you need to make, maybe you made them where you're, where you're at today. Right where you are. While we're praying, you made some decisions. And maybe it's something you made known in public. Maybe it's just something between you and God. But if there's some reason, something that we can help you with, maybe pray for you. Maybe you need us to hold you accountable in some area of your life. Whatever it is, we're going to sing a song of decision. You have a decision. May come as we sing. Stand with me. Come. <laughs>